the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, Sri Lanka and creditors reached agreement on the terms bond restructuring, bringing the nation closer to completing its debt overhaul two years after it defaulted. Sri Lanka to hand over its Chinese-built airport operations to a consortium with Indian and Russian firm despite US advice. Stocks closed down, marking the second consecutive day in a negative trajectory, while foreign inflows accounted for 50% of turnover. And Amazon founder Jeff Bezos plans to sell nearly 5 billion US dollars in company shares as stocks hit all-time high. From Studio 24, here's Sina Mayaduni. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Sri Lanka and sovereign bondholders have reached a deal to exchange $14.43 billion in defaulted bonds and overdue interest for new instruments linked to future gross domestic product growth, governance and also standard fixed interest bonds. Bondholders have also agreed to an 11% haircut on $1.9 billion of past due interest, compared to an earlier proposal according to a London Stock Exchange filing. Sri Lanka will exchange $12.55 billion for bonds with an initial haircut of 28%, which include bonds with a state contingent factor involving future dollar gross domestic product. The deal will have to be confirmed by the Secretariat of Sri Lanka's official creditor committee to ensure comparability with their restructure terms and IMF staff on compliance with a debt sustainability analysis, the government has reported. The gains under the GDP link will be capped at 85% of the original principal representing a minimum haircut of 15% on the bonds, in a deal with representatives of bondholders who collectively hold about 50% of the securities. Sri Lanka will also pay a consent fee equal to 1.8% on the original bonds or $225 million to persuade all bondholders to accept the deal. Sri Lanka has been included in the Swiss government-funded GTEx2 program for 2024 to 2027, which seeks to improve the capabilities of the local apparel sector and increase its presence in the global market. Switzerland's State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency and the International Trade Centre fund and provide technical assistance in the second phase of its global program on textile and clothing, also known as GTEx2. The Sri Lanka Export Development Board said that the five-year program will support textile and clothing industry SMEs to improve their operational capacities, including social norms and environmental sustainability, add value to existing products and services and expand exports to traditional and new markets. The first phase, GTEx-1, was carried out in Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. The second phase will be carried out in Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan and Sri Lanka. The EDB and the Joint Apparel Association Forum of Sri Lanka will collaborate with the Swiss Confederation in implementation of the program in the island. A national project coordinator has been recruited for Sri Lanka to implement the project activities. Aviation Minister Nimal Siripala de Silva said that Sri Lanka will hand over its Chinese-built airport operations to a consortium with Indian and Russian firms, despite the United States has informed about a U.S. sanction on the key stakeholder of Moscow firm. A joint venture between Sharia Aeronautics, Private Limited of India and Airports of Regions Management Company of Russia has won the contract to manage Sri Lanka's Matala Rajapaksa International Airport for 30 years. However, officials from the United States have approached Sri Lankan government to inform that the key stakeholder of Russia's airports of regions management company is sanctioned by the U.S. Secretary in 2018 for suspended meddling in the 2016 U.S. elections. Minister De Silva stated that it is not true and that they have checked it and it's only a rumor. Minister De Silva stated that this fact is simply not true. He added that he asked them to give him evidence and nobody was able to furnish said evidence. De Silva later said that a top official at the U.S. Embassy also advised him on the Russian firm. Further addressing, he said that they're going to hand over the Matala airport to the Russian and Indian consortium and they had gone through a tedious procedure. He said he thinks within a few weeks' time they'll be able to hand over the airport and that they're going to take over the airport. 
The airport, built at a cost of $209 million, was once dubbed the world's emptiest airport because of a lack of flights. The minister said it incurs a loss of 3 billion rupees annually. Minister Nima Siripala de Silva also said that Sri Lanka will meet representatives of the Japan International Corporation Agency to start talks on resuming work on an airport terminal that was halted after reaching a deal with official creditors. Japan halted loans to Sri Lanka after the sovereign default was declared in April 2022. He told reporters that next week the GICA is coming to see him and it is the benefit of restructuring. They have agreed to give additional finances necessary for the escalation of prices as well. He stated that to complete the terminal, a new Japanese contractor has been selected. State Minister of Finance Shehan Seymasinghe has announced the decision to commence survey activities for the second phase of the Aswasuma program. The State Minister of Finance stated that this decision was made during a special discussion held today at the Ministry with the Welfare Benefits Board. The survey activities are scheduled to officially commence on the 15th of June. The Minister stated that in the expectation of promptly starting the distribution of benefits for the second phase, the activities will commence in every possible district. Minister Sema Singh emphasized that this is the most suitable opportunity to verify if any party is receiving benefits without proper qualifications. In the meantime, those who have not yet submitted applications for the second phase of the Aswasuma benefits will have the opportunity to do so within the upcoming week. Approximately 475,000 applications have been received so far for the second phase. Out of these, information from around 450,000 applications has been entered into the system while the remaining 25,000 applications have errors. The minister stated that government goal is to provide Aswasuma benefits to 2.4 million families. According to the minister, the necessary funds have been allocated for this purpose and every step will be taken to ensure that the benefits are provided to the most suitable group. Let's go for a short break. More updates coming right after this. This is an Isla Business Report. back to the Nile Business Report. The Colombo Stock Exchange continues its downward trend, marking another day of losses. Both the All Share Price Index and the S&P SL20 Index hit new lows at today's close, extending the ongoing negative trajectory. To get a briefing on today's trading, let's join with Minal Vikramage from Capital Alliance Securities. Today, the Colombo Stock Exchange concluded on a negative note in comparison to the previous trading session brought on by unfavorable sentiment among market participants. The market ended at 11,926 points, uh, making a 110-point decrease from the previous session and at, with the turnover of 1.9 billion rupees. The SL20 index also experienced a decline of 31.25 movements to end the day at 3,512 points. Notable institutional engagement was observed across various sectors with crossings recorded on John Keel's Holdings, Sambat Bank, and EB Creasy Company. and Company. The top five gainers for the day were TransAsia Holding Hotels, Bandside Royal Resorts PLC, Hunas Holdings PLC, the Fortress Resorts PLC, and Mahar Village Rivers PLC. The top five losers for the day were Sankaragra Finance, UB Finance, the Nurelia Hotels Company, Amana Takaful Life, and Malwat Valley Plantations PLC. Sri Lanka recently entered into agreements with bondholders as part of its debt restructuring efforts which could stabilize the fixed income market by reducing perceived risk and enhancing investor confidence, potentially leading to lower yields and higher bond prices. Moving forward, how will these ongoing procedures impact the fixed income and the equity market within the upcoming days? Let's pose that question to Vinodini Rajapupati connecting with us from First Capital Hall. Things. The secondary market pivoted from its selling sentiment displayed during the previous sessions and witnessed a considerable amount of bids received during the day as Sri Lanka has secured a deal to move forward on the restructuring of USD 12.5 billion in international bonds. 
the restructuring of bonds was one of the key conditions set by the IMF under the USD 2.9 billion bailout program that helped Sri Lanka tame inflation, stabilize its currency, and improve public finances. The framework proposes a 28% haircut on face value and 11% reduction on past interest with payments on the interest component to start from September. Moreover, the restructuring is expected to lead to an upgrade of Sri Lanka's credit rating from its current uh, restricted default status. This improvement could attract more foreign investments into the equity markets driven by perceived undervaluation and improved market conditions. Moreover, going back to the secondary market, limited trades were recorded during the day justifying the limit, uh, limited activity as the investors yearned for more further clarity on the market sentiment and impact. Gold prices steadied at a 10-day high in Asian trade today after growing bets on interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve pulled down the dollar and treasury yield. Spot gold rose 0.1% to $2,359.56 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in August fell 0.1% to $2,367.15 an ounce. But gold's advance was stalled by hawkish signals from the minutes of the Fed's June meeting, while anticipation of key non-farm payrolls data kept traders cautious. Gold benefits from rate cut bets, but caution persists. The yellow metal marked strong gains yesterday, tracking a sharp fall in the dollar as traders upped their bets for a rate cut in September. Oil prices edged lower today, retreating from the previous session's multi-month highs with investors taking profits as demand caution remained in focus despite last week's decline in U.S. inventories. Brent crude futures were down 43 cents or 0.49 percent at $86.91 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures fell 49 cents or 0.58 percent to $83.39 in trade thinned by the U.S. Independence Day holiday. In the previous session, Brent gained 1.3% to settle at $87.34 for its highest since April 30. WTI, meanwhile, had settled at an 11-week high of $83.88. Those gains followed a larger-than-expected decline in U.S. crude stocks. Today, the Sri Lankan rupee has shown a slight depreciation against the U.S. dollar compared to yesterday, as reported by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. The buying rate of the U.S. dollar has risen from 298 rupees and 72 cents to 299 rupees and 68 cents, and the selling rate has increased from 308 rupees and 17 cents to 308 rupees and 92 cents. The rupee has also declined against various foreign currencies, and let's see how its exchange rates are now. A short commercial break now, news from the corporate world coming on the other side. This is the Nile Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. Qatar Airways' Sri Lankan Doha flights will be increased from the current five-day schedule to six daily flights starting 10th of July 2024. The dedication to providing more choices and better connectivity for all passengers flying to and from Sri Lanka is further demonstrated by the award-winning airline through this increase in flights. The Boeing 787 aircraft featuring 30 business class seats and 281 economy class seats will serve the additional flights. A total of 42 weekly flights to and from Sri Lanka will be operated by Qatar Airways with this network enhancement connecting passengers to nearly 170 global destinations worldwide. 
The increased flights were announced by Jonathan Fernando, the Qatar Airways country manager to Sri Lanka and Maldives, who stated that they are thrilled to be increasing their flights to and from Sri Lanka to provide even better connectivity to their passengers. He added that this flight increase is a testament to their commitment in providing the passengers with the best travel experience possible on board the world's best airline. With more flights to and from Sri Lanka via their home hub Hamad International Airport, they hope to make it easier for more travellers to discover their dream destination with their robust network. Passengers will be provided with more options to connect to major destinations in the Middle East, Europe, Africa and more via Skytax World Best Airport, Hamad International Airport, by the newly added flights. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos is planning to sell nearly 5 billion US dollar worth of shares in the technology giant. The planned sale by the world's second richest person comes as Amazon's stock surge to an all-time high, putting it in the exclusive club of companies with a 2 trillion dollar valuation. The proposed sale of 25 million shares was disclosed in a notice filed after market hours on Tuesday when the stock price climbed $200.43. That marks a 30% jump from the beginning of the year, far outpacing the 4% average gain in the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index. Once it goes through, Bezos owns about 912 million Amazon shares, or 8.8% of the outstanding stock. He saw shares worth roughly $8.5 billion in February, after the stock railed 80% in 2023. Bezos, with an estimated net worth of $214.4 billion, US dollars, according to the Forbes Billionaires list, is also founder of space company Blue Origin, with launch a six-person crew to edge off the space in May. Amazon's value has been catapulted by an artificial intelligence wave sweeping the world, with companies turning to its subsidiary cloud computing company, Amazon Web Series, for computing power and state-of-the-art software. Brazil, the country that gave the world natural rubber, has become the latest export market for Seat tyres manufactured in Sri Lanka. Seat Kalani Holdings recently dispatched its first export consignment to tyres to Brazil, the second country in South America to join the company's international footprint, which covers 16 countries. The commencement of export to Brazil was preceded by Seat Kalani receiving the requisite in-metro certification from the National Institute of Metrology, Standardization and Industrial Quality, Brazil's national standards body. Seat is also the only locally manufactured tyre brand certified by the International Automotive Task Force for compliance with the international standard for automotive quality management systems. Additionally, tyres exported by Seat Kalani are EMARC certified by the Economic Commission for Europe, which is a mandatory requirement for all automotive components sold in the European Economic Area. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nile Business Report. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. World stocks clocked up more record highs today after US data had narrowed the odds on a September Fed interest rate cut, while Europe was on politics watch again as UK voters headed to the polls in national elections. Japan's Nikkei climbed 0.8% to within spitting distance of its March peak, while the broader topics clinched all-time highs. Taiwan's main index also struck a record led by the tech sector and Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co cleared 1,000 Taiwan dollars for the first time. The Australian dollar was a notable gainer, touching a six-month peak of 0.67 dollars as markets are waggering the next move in local rates could be higher. The yen remained out in the cold, hitting multi-year lows on a host of currencies as investors continued to favour carry traders. The S&P 500 and the technology-laden Nasdaq rose to post record highs closes as data pointing to a softening economy raised hopes the Federal Reserve could cut interest rates in September. The S&P 500 and Nasdaq posted record high closes in a holiday-shortened trading session Wednesday as data pointing to a softening economy raised hopes the Federal Reserve could cut interest rates in September. The Dow finished down slightly, while the S&P 500 gained half a percent and the Nasdaq climbed nearly nine-tenths of a percent. 
Both the ADP employment report and weekly jobless claims data pointed to easing labor market conditions ahead of Friday's closely watched non-farm payrolls report. Investors boosted bets of a September rate cut to over 70 percent, according to LSEG's FedWatch. Notable stock movers included Tesla, which jumped 6.5 percent Wednesday after surging more than 10 percent Tuesday when it posted a smaller-than-expected drop in second-quarter vehicle deliveries. At least five brokers also raised their price targets on the stock, which is trading at its highest level since January. And shares of AI chip darling NVIDIA gained more than 4.5 percent. Other stocks on the move included Paramount Global, which rose almost 7 percent after Sherry Redstone's National Amusements reached a preliminary deal to sell its controlling interest in the media giant to David Ellison's Skydance Media. And shares of First Foundation slumped nearly 24 percent after the lender, which holds a huge portfolio of multifamily real estate loans, disclosed a $228 million unexpected capital raise. Markets will be closed Thursday for the July 4th holiday. Japanese companies delivered the biggest wage hikes in three decades this year, the nation's largest union said, prompted by labor shortages and an inflationary squeeze on household income. Japanese companies delivered the biggest wage hikes in three decades this year. That's according to the nation's largest union on Wednesday. It said monthly pay was up 5.1% on average this year, with both big and small firms following the trend. The outcome of what's called the Shunto, or Spring Labour Negotiations, is seen as key for Japan to achieve a positive cycle of economic recovery. It would help improve household income and consumption to outweigh the rising cost of living. Any positive and self-sustaining growth could also help policymakers put an end to deflation. It might also bring the Bank of Japan closer to further interest rate hikes. In mid-March, major firms said pay rises had accelerated to 5.2.8%, which was the biggest since the 1990s. The central bank then made its landmark decision to end negative interest rates. But income inequalities remain, with small firms finding it hard to offer big wage increases. To address such issues, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's administration has vowed to raise minimum hourly pay to 1,500 yen, or $9.27, from around 1,000 yen by the mid-2030s. Well, that is it from us at the Naila Business Report for the day. Tune in again tomorrow for more updates. Until then, I'm Sina Maya Have a good night.